Hey, it's Dean Z speaking to you live from my office for our call-in show. Should we get started? First question. Hi, Dean Z and Dustin. This is Rachel in Tennessee. Longtime listener, first time caller. I enjoyed the recent episode in which Dean Z gave some background information about the law school rankings and trends of the past few decades. I'm curious about trends in the law school application process. What changes have you seen in the process or in applicants themselves during your career? What are some trends or changes you hope to see in the future? Thanks. Have a great day. Great question. I have a couple of thoughts. Uh, so changes in application processes, I, I'm really thinking mostly about the kinds of things people tell us. So we see much more in 2023 of people talking to us very openly about challenges that they have overcome, maybe even traumas that they have had. Uh, that can be very useful to an admissions office because it puts everything in context. All the achievements that you have, we are now seeing against the backdrop of something that you had to grapple with that maybe most applicants didn't have to grapple with. So I like that, but there's also a cautionary note, which is not everybody does this well. So it's not enough to simply talk about you know, this context. You have to show how this is an obstacle that you have overcome, that you've come out the other side and that whatever uh, problem you had in the past is not one that you're going to have in law school because, of course, a law school admissions office wants to make sure that you're going to succeed if they admit you. So I think sometimes people understand that talking about their adversity can really give a full picture of them, but may not understand the need to tie it all up in a bow and sh end it on a positive note. So that's something um, that I have noted with interest, uh, mostly positively, but with some caution too. The other big trend that I have noticed over the years too is that people are much more apparently certain about wanting to go to law school. When I started in this business almost a quarter century ago, I saw a lot of essays from people who were like, I may want to be a lawyer, may not want to be a lawyer, like a lot of essays like that, or people who would just very clearly not put any thought into it. And we still see that, but I see many more people who have very evidently done their due diligence and expressed that to us. And I think that is a very positive trend. Then in terms of other trends, I just want to say, there's a lot of trends, uh, a lot of, sorry, changes that, uh, you know, I think will be coming to law school uh, admissions in the future. So mentioned rankings, that, that has an as yet unforeseen effect on how people will go about admissions work. But I would also say uh, there's changes coming in terms of the Supreme Court decision that we expect in May or June in the Harvard and North Carolina cases that are going to have an effect on the way schools can, can or may not be able to take race into account in admissions going forward. There is uh, the ABA is contemplating a number of changes, most significant of which is potentially telling schools that they no longer have to require an admissions test, which would have a huge effect on how law schools consider doing admissions. And then a small one that I think is really important is chat GPT. And it's, a, you know, we rely a lot on essays. Should we be thinking about asking for different kinds of essays? Should we, we be reading our essays in a different way? We've been experimenting with it a little bit here in my office, uh, asking it to do certain kinds of essays. And I think we're pretty adept at figuring out what is uh, real and what is not. But I think, I think it will be all the more important that uh, applicants, when they're writing essays, are very precise and detailed about their lives so that they don't end up looking like AI. Thanks for the question, Rachel. It was great. Okay, next one. Hi, Dean Z. In true A to Z fashion, I have two questions. First, an admissions, and then a grammar question for you. So first up, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about resume updates. I'm a mid-fall applicant who recently, in late January, has gotten a new job. And I was wondering what the best way to notify admissions committees of this is. Should I send a whole new resume just with this new job added? Should I simply send an email or a paragraph explaining my new job? What should I do if I don't completely know what my job description, roles, duties, responsibilities is going to be yet. Any advice you have would be really greatly appreciated. I'm going to stop it there and we'll go back 
to the grammar question later. But let's start with this. Okay, this is pretty simple. I think the answer is both and. Definitely do a new resume showing your job, showing the job title, and whatever information you may have about the duties, even if it's in skeletal form. Everybody's going to understand that you either haven't started yet or you've been doing it for a couple weeks, so no one's going to mind that you can't really spell out in great detail what you will be doing. Uh, but then also, you know, send that as an attachment to an email, and in the email, have just a brief paragraph saying, I recently got this new job, uh, this is my title, uh, and you know, this is, if, if it's a very well-known company, I don't think you need to uh, explain what they do, but if it's something that is you know, not completely well-known, you should say, this is a consulting company, or this is a company that uh, makes the best t-shirts in the Midwest, or whatever it is. Um, and so, just a little bit of detail, with the resume attached and you are good to go. Thanks for calling, that was great. All right, next question. Hi, Dean Z, a big fan of your show and calling in from Michigan. I'm just wondering, uh, what are some good ways, what are your recommendations for showing interest in a school that you really wanna go to? Great question. All right, so I think it depends a little bit on what stage of the process you are in. If you're at the if you're putting your application together at the beginning make sure you take advantage of any opportunity to submit an essay about the school if they invite you to write a school specific essay um, if if they don't do that you know maybe make sure that there is a paragraph or two as part of your personal statement that suggests this uh, if uh, you can also have letter writers who specifically say I know that uh, you know Dustin Law School is this person's first choice and would go if accepted. Uh, those are all good ways at the outset. If, however, you are trying to show interest because you haven't gotten a decision yet or because you have been waitlisted and you're waiting to see if you, know, you can do anything to increase your chances of getting an offer, then I would say similarly, but you know, supplement. So if you haven't written... Uh, an essay about the school and that's an opportunity for you, do that. If you've done that already and there's some other kind of essay you can write to show your interest, do that. Uh, if you can't do anything like that, send an email just saying, I am all in for Dustin Law School um, and would come in a heartbeat if that's true. Uh, do that. If it's not true, if you you know, if there are parameters on like, I wouldn't be able to come uh, unless you gave me a scholarship of X amount, you know, I don't know that I would specify that in law school, in it rather in an email, but I'd still show your interest. Just be, you know, don't don't say something that is not one hundred percent correct. Um, what else can you do? Uh, some people like to come visit, and or uh, have say alumni or some other, you know, mentor of yours or something send an email to the admissions office to, you know, indicate your interest. You have to be careful with that. You don't want to tip over from showing interest into putting pressure on the law school. So nobody likes to feel that they are being, you know, having their arm twisted to make a decision. So if you're relying on a mentor to reach out and sing your praises, just make sure that the person is the, you know, think about, like, does this person seem like the kind of person who uh, will maybe be inappropriate, you know, um, and be a little too pushy? Uh, maybe give them guidance, like just if you could just say something gentle, something like that. Um, in terms of visiting, if a school has a process in place, then great, by all means, do that. If they don't have a process for having you come visit, I would hesitate about doing so because you don't want them to feel uh, like they have to uh, accommodate something that they may not be staffed to do or in a position at the time of year you want to do it to, to do that. So, you know, be respectful of their process that way. But I do think it is a very good impulse to show an interest in a school if you have a specific reason for being interested. And especially if you are trying to turn the tide, you're waiting to hear a, a decision and you want to get something positive, that can be really helpful. So, um, thanks. Next question. Hello, Dean Zierfoss. I'm Ozzy recording my question from Houston. Thank you for creating the A to Z vlog. 
I really enjoy watching your vlog episodes and I've found them to be very beneficial throughout the admissions process. Say that in a hypothetical situation, an applicant submitted their application to a law school in September or October, and upon completing a review of the applicant's file, the admissions committee is on the fence about their decision. What does the process look like for the admissions committee to go back to a file to reach a decision, perhaps after seeing the strength of the applicant pool come, say, February or March? And if you could, please also opine on how similar or different Michigan law schools process may be to other law schools. Thank you. Thank you, Ozzy. Uh, okay, so not every school has this process of uh, reading a file and feeling on the fence, as you put it, or just not quite able to make a decision. Michigan does, and the extent to which I use it just depends on a given year and, and, and you know, and what I'm seeing in the pool, uh, or perhaps like my decisiveness in a given day or month. Um, what we do is, uh, you know, I read a file and if I can't make a decision because maybe something, maybe there's an unanswered question or maybe I like some things, but I'm, you know, a little worried about something else. I put it aside. I assign it a particular status. We call it Apple delay, application delay. Um, and then I go back to that at regular intervals. Some one of my stuff brings me all the Apple delays every couple weeks and uh, I go through them and see if I either feel more decisive or if some new information has come in that helps clarify something for me. So similar to the question I just a uh, answered about showing interest, I would say if you think that you might be in this position because you applied early and you haven't gotten an answer, I would encourage you to go back and look at your application and see, are there any holes, any unanswered questions that might, you know, have concerned an admissions office? So if you weren't apply, if you weren't employed at the time you applied and now you have a job, by all means, follow up and let them know that. If, um, you know, they invite you to write an optional essay, but you just wrote a personal statement and didn't write any additional essay, consider writing an additional essay now to show that you, you know, you're putting that work in and that you are that interested in the school. Uh, yeah, if there, uh, one thing that sometimes comes up is if you have some kind of misconduct, sometimes you haven't, sometimes the applicant doesn't explain it really well, and I'm just a little concerned about it. So go back and look at that and see maybe there's more information you could add or, you know, be more explicit about taking responsibility for something. Um, so if, anything like that that you can use to clarify what's already in your application materials that will be very helpful. Uh, and then in terms of what's our process like compared to other schools, I just don't know. That is a great question, and I really don't know how other schools approach it. I, I, yeah, that's all I, I, I actually have never talked about this with my colleagues, so I wish I had something to tell you there, but I, I don't. But I do feel like even if their processes are quite different, the advice I'm giving about going back and looking at your application, clarifying anything that might um, have been wanting, that is good advice, regardless of what their process is. Okay, thank you for calling in. Next, okay, next we have. Hi, DNC, and to Dustin as well. Um, my name is Madison, and I'm coming to you live from the Dominican Republic, where I'm currently a Peace Corps volunteer. I started in August of 2022, which would put me at an end date of November 2024. And my current plan is to apply in the upcoming cycle to start in the fall of 2024, which obviously doesn't mesh well with my November 2024 end date for the Peace Corps. I would then, upon acceptance, either defer law school or terminate my Peace Corps service a few months early in order to make it to law school for the fall. My question for you is twofold. Do admissions teams typically know enough about Peace Corps to recognize that I would not be finished until November of 2024? And based on that information, would there be a higher probability that I would be denied if they recognized there was a strong possibility of deferral? Thank you so much. And I'm a huge fan of your show. Thank you so much for all that you do for the law application community. Very kind. And sorry if there are children screaming in the background um, currently at the school. So thanks so much. Have a great day. 
Uh, this is a very good question. I'm going to make it a little broader than just Peace Corps, though, because uh, I think this comes up in a lot of contexts. I think it is unlikely that an admissions office is going to be uh, very familiar with end dates of various programs, whether it's a fellowship or a master's program or a Peace Corps. So on the one hand, not that likely. On the other hand, if they are aware of it, it could really go wrong for you, either because they don't want to deal with you asking for a deferral in general. Law schools like to under, like to review your application in the year in which you want to attend. Uh, so, or they think, well, maybe this person plans to, you know, ditch the Peace Corps without telling them, or ditch whatever program it is without telling them, which doesn't speak well to that person's character. So, I would say. Take the bull by the horns here. And so either, you know, make up your mind which way you want to go and be forthcoming with the law school in your application process. So either say, you will see that I am, you know, in in an addendum. You'll see that I am participating in whatever program. It runs through November, yada, yada. I, if you are able to admit me, I will be asking for a deferral so that I can join you in fall of 2025 and complete my service in this program. Either do that or talk to your program and get their permission for leaving early if necessary. And then say, you will see that I am in this program. The the end date goes after your start date. I have already confirmed that I will be able to leave early. no, I just I want to say I think this is the best way to handle it because I think it is always better to be direct and honest. But I will also say, in most cases, probably this will go right over the admissions officer's head. So, you know, you have to decide yourself what seems right for you. But uh, I think being very direct is, is the right way to handle this. Thanks so much for your question. And um, I loved hearing the children in the background. It was cute. Okay, next question. Hi, Dean Z. Um, I had a question about international applicants applying from undergraduate institutions outside the U.S. Um, so without going into too much detail, uh, my story is that I am a non-U.S. citizen. I spent part of my childhood in the U.S. and then I moved back to my home country, which is outside of North America, where I did my undergrad and where I'm currently working now. Um, I just wanted to ask if there's anything that you would be looking for or even any hesitations that you might have in an international student's application that might differ from how you would view a traditional application. So would it be necessary to explain why I want to go to the U.S. for law school or mention any specific career plans in my personal statement? And also, as a side note, I was wondering if it might be a disadvantage to mention um, public interest aspirations, since it would likely be more difficult to get visa sponsoring jobs in that field as a non-citizen. So I would greatly appreciate any advice that you have, and thank you so much. Okay, this is a great question. I just want to note at the outset that uh, the questioner seems very sophisticated about the process. So that is impressive and suggests to me that uh, you will do well in this process because you've clearly put a lot of thought into it and done a lot of research already. So there are two things that admissions offices, I think, care a lot about when they are looking at international applicants. The first is, will they be able to keep up with the classroom dialogue, which is very fast paced. It's a back and forth. It's not a lecture scenario. So you have to be native level fluency because you're hearing lots of different voices, uh, you know, lots of accents, all kinds of things. It's, it's not just adjusting to the voice of the professor. And you have to be ready to be called on and have a, you know, a colloquy back and forth with the professor. So having native level, level English is extremely important. The way that people try to suss this out is Number one, where did you go to undergrad? So you, in this question, have gone to an undergrad um, outside of the U.S. So that will be a little bit of a warning signal. On the other hand, it's very clear from your question that you do have native level fluency. So I I think if that's the case, you want to refer to that in various ways. Uh, I wouldn't do it in a heavy-handed, like, don't worry, I'll be able to understand what's going on in the classroom. I would just talk about, you know, I spent time in the U.S. growing up. Uh, I would talk about, uh, you know, just just in, look for ways to indicate your familiarity and comfort with communicating in English. 
And then the other place the you know admissions offices look to assess this is with your LSAT writing sample, where you know which is written under timed conditions, and you know you doesn't have you don't have the ability to have anybody else edit out any mistakes. So that's one way we get a sense of whether this is non-native English uh, usage. So uh, that's something for people to bear in mind who are international applicants. And then in terms of career plans, that is the other area in which uh, admissions offices who are aware of these issues will be thinking about this. Uh, people who are non-US citizens uh, or permanent residents need to get certain particular visas to work in the US and those that can be a complicated and expensive process. So big law firms, they're well suited to being able to do this. Uh, and you know small public interest offices aren't so much. So I think you are really onto something with maybe not talking about your public interest aspirations unless what you really want is to work in go back to your home country and work in public interest in which case totally different set of considerations. If what you want is to work in the U.S., uh, I think it's fine to say that, but I, you know, you should be aware that if you're talking about public interest organizations as being your, your, you know, desired setting, that that might cause problems. So that that will be something that law law admissions offices are looking at. Like, do you look like someone who might want to work in a big law firm? Uh, does it look like you'd be well suited for that? And that would will make them feel a little less hesitant uh, or a little less concerned about uh, admitting you. Okay, thanks. And again, you seem like you've really done your homework, so that's great. Uh, okay, one last substantive question, and then we will also have a grammar question. Hi, Team Z. I'm a big fan of the show. My question is, when we're thinking about what to do after we get all these decisions from different schools, you know, let's say you get an offer of admission from the school of your choice, but either no scholarship or a very small scholarship offer, should you consider declining the offer and retaking the LSAT in order to reapply the following year with a higher score in order to be a more appealing candidate for a scholarship offer? Or would that be too big of a gamble or is it just not necessary? And is this something we should be openly communicating about with admissions when you're considering this option? Thanks so much for your help. So first off, I want to say I totally get why uh, the impulse to retake in order to get scholarship money. But a lot of this is knowable before you apply. And that is really the time, if possible, to do this calculation. Um, you know, if, you're, if your LSAT is below median at a school, you you should know that like you you might get scholarship money but it probably won't be as much as if you are above median so if that's very important to you i'd think about it before i apply rather than after you've gotten an offer uh, i do think it is a huge risk to decline and then retake and reapply for two reasons one a lot of schools quite understandably in my view feel like you had your bite at the apple we admitted you you didn't say yes I'm not going to keep admitting you when I don't know what's, what it's going to take for you to say yes. So that's risk one. You reapply and just get told no. Risk two is you cannot guarantee that you will do better on the LSAT. So you might do this, retake, and then, you know, be unhappy. I, I, I think it would actually be better if you were really intent on retaking if you just held on to your offer and retook and then submitted that higher, hopefully higher score, and see then if you can get more scholarship money. Um, and I do think and you, you talked about like should I be forthcoming about this with the law school admissions office? I, I think that is worth doing. I think talking about your concerns and um, and your you know the parameters you have financially is always worth doing, and they should totally be willing to have that conversation. So I'd encourage you to do that, but do it. Now, don't wait till the very end of the process when they're going to feel very under pressure to bring in their class and aren't going to be in a great position for having, you know, heartfelt chats about um, your financial situation. At that point, they'll, they'll be, you know, sort of underwater and, and, and it won't be a great time to get the answer that you want. So do it now. All right. And now we have our grammar question. Second, I was wondering if you could give a little advice about um, punctuation marks in emails and writing a professional email 
I've seen some people say that you should always end the heading with a colon. So writing Dear Dean Zierfoss with a colon. Um, is it, do you like the colon? Do you like the comma? Um, what are your feelings about exclamation points in the emails? Is there such a thing as too many? Um, any advice you might have for writing a professional email with good punctuation is so appreciated. And I think I speak for a lot of applicants when I say thanks so much for your transparency in doing this podcast. Great question, Elizabeth. First, I'll start with the easy one, how to open. A colon is the way you open traditionally a uh, very formal business letter. So yeah, dear Dean Zierfoss colon, as you say. Uh, but I don't know that, that that certainly wouldn't be wrong in an email, but I don't think it is necessary. I think a comma is perfectly appropriate or even an M dash. Um, I also think you could say, hi, Dean Zierfoss, instead of dear Dean Zierfoss to make it a little less formal. You know, don't get into full on casual territory. I had a friend who does this at another law school tell me once, maybe a decade ago, that she got an email beginning SUP, you know, S-U-P. I don't know that she's ever gotten over that. So don't do that and I think you'll be safe. Now let's talk about exclamation points because you are my people. I too am a lover of exclamation points, arguably too many. So here are my rules of thumb. I like write my email with all my feelings and all my exclamation points and then I go back and edit them out. So I try never to have two in one paragraph. I, nev I try never to have two in two sentences in a row. Uh, and in general, I just think taking out half of whatever I initially put in there is usually a good impulse because it does make you look slightly like unhinged to have too many exclamation points. Like you're just a little too excited. I am excited. That is how I go through life. But you don't, you know, it can be upsetting to people who aren't, you know. So great question and uh, thank you for calling and asking. And I think that's all we have for you today. Thanks so much to everybody who did this. I had so much fun. You all have such nice voices. So, you know, please continue sending us questions, you know, to law.jd.admissions at umich.edu or putting them below in the comments line. But if you want to send us a question and you want to do it as a, a voice memo, we love it. Do it. Send it along. Uh, yeah. And thanks also for helping me prove Dustin to be very, very wrong when he said this wasn't going to work. Wherever you go. Go blue.